morning everyone so it's quite early for me but i think so it should be evening for you nishant right yeah it's about 9:40 pacific time in the us west coast california yeah it's for it's like 6:30 in the morning for me so i'm joining oh. from amsterdam oh, okay and uh, today's topic is a very special one guys it's a uh, it's about uh, privacy engineering so we have talked a lot about uh, policies and how cookie consents uh, drive uh, the world of privacy but uh, when when you talk about implementation it's always falls upon data because essentially it's the data that we are managing and it's all about uh, then gets to the it systems and how we build them and make sure that uh, they are compliant and uh, support the compliance so this topic is very near to my heart because i'll tell you my background maybe you guys do not know me uh, who i am and uh, uh, what we do so so guys i am the head of technical staff at saro i take care of we at saro we take care of uh, we build solutions uh, related to privacy and security and make sure that these are optimized they are low cost and we are able to uh, when we go to our client we are not just talking about policies we are also able to talk tech to them and we are able to make our uh, footprint on the landscape uh, it landscape for me i am your fellow uh, cipm i started back my career from amazon as a software dev john pwc now i'm leading saro along with akash and krishna i'm also a certified solution architect for uh, azure so basically cloud is my domain so that is where i come from and we also have nishant here who is the uh, director of privacy and data analytics at uber so nishant can you tell us something about yourself and nishant has also is a an author right nishant about yes, being in the i'll share the link to my book uh, in the chat window momentarily yeah so nishant yeah so as uh, was just mentioned a few seconds ago i am the director of privacy engineering at uber i've had similar roles before at google netflix and before that at nike and i got into this space almost by accident more than a decade ago i was fixing a problem with the data backend at webmd and by the way i just sent the link on the zoom chat the book's doing very well i'm sure uh people who read it will derive value especially considering the excitement around this topic so i was an engineer just like many of you on this call my job was to essentially build capabilities that directly or indirectly so front end and sometimes back end benefited or protected the customer and because i was in the healthcare sector i had an understanding of what protecting data actually meant but i also noticed that in that sector as well companies that handled data about their employees about patients didn't have the right techniques or tools forget scale for a second they didn't even have the knowledge of what to do or what the risk vectors were so i started asking questions because i'm like you know i shouldn't be processing this file because it contains a lot of sensitive data or i should be doing more before i disposition this so back more than a decade ago that is what privacy security engineering was we we didn't have sufficient sophisticated anomaly detection we didn't have any kind of alerting mechanisms there was no soc there was no sas or seam tools so i became a privacy engineer by default just because i wouldn't shut up and i kept asking questions and over time it became obvious to me and to my manager at the time that these questions were actually going somewhere there was something fundamentally shifting in terms of how powerful data was over the course of the last decade we've had universal id ubiquitous internet access we had people accessing multiple tools at once we had cloud storage we had analytics all of that collectively meant alongside the fact that engineers were, were more a lot more bottom up that is people had a lot more power over central it collectively meant that the risk vectors increased in in the background and it's only when something bad happened that people realized that things were not working correctly so when there was a breach or when there was a, a major fine people realized there was a problem but what people did not know is the things that they were doing incorrectly for years or months leading up to those incidents so i've actually been behind the scenes i've made some of those mistakes i've fixed other people's mistakes so the book that i've written and the course that is being released this week by a company called data protocol collectively represent how do you get privacy right on the engineering side whether you have a privacy engineer like myself or you have routine regular engineers how do you create a culture not based on first principles or high value high level talking points but how do you build the tools the processes the efficiencies that become part of the company's bloodstream 
regardless of your privacy expertise and you can protect yourself and the user. So that's a bit of my intro, former engineer, former product manager. I've been the person that takes privacy for granted. And now I'm the person that prevents other people from taking privacy for granted. So that's my history. Uh, if you need to understand more, the book's available and I'm looking forward to the next 45 minutes or so. Nishan, nice to hear from you. I um, literally liked when you say that you felt uneasy when you had somebody's data, somebody's file uh, in your hand. So privacy always starts with a social responsibility where uh, we know that, okay, the data we have, it's not ours. Should we even have it? But we ha also have to build a process around it because it cannot go ad hoc. That, okay, I got a file. I shouldn't have that. Okay, I'll not see it. It cannot happen. We have to build a process around that. There has to be a process, uh, an access control, or maybe... Uh, Nobody should have what to say. They, they, the file should not be even available, even to most of the people. So with GDPR, we say that uh, the production data is not should not be available to uh, the testers or the, even, even the software engineers. So it's a shift left that we see around the whole of the software world, where uh, more and more power is being given to the developers, but uh, it comes with the responsibility. And in privacy engineering, we'll discuss that responsibility. And Nishan, I hope your book really makes an impact and helps the privacy community grow with it. Yeah, I think something you mentioned is we shouldn't have the file. I think the problem, I, I agree with you at the principal level. The problem is, so when I was an engineer, I often cite this fundamental shift. When I was writing code 10, 15 years ago, there was a very, very strong sense of regulation within the company. We didn't have GDPR or CCPA or any of these laws back then, but central IT was really powerful, which meant that any kind of auth and auth Z protocols were enforced a lot more rigidly. I couldn't just store data on my laptop and walk home with it. I couldn't just create a new storage bucket that was outside the reach of security and privacy. So what has fundamentally changed is that now uh, engineers with two or three years of experience have a ton of power, have a ton of visibility. They can basically have access to their own CI CD pipeline. They can build an API that egresses data and the monitoring capabilities don't always keep up because what happens is if you don't know that I have built a service to collect or egress data, you will not be able to manage or throttle or rate limit it. So, so essentially, it's not just a case of a fundamentally different engineering culture. It's about making sure that there is so much data, so many engineers, so many services that you can't stop people from doing the wrong thing. That's the problem. Now, in my case, I caught that one file because it was sent directly to me and it was my job to manually process that file through SSIS. Now the files are built, received, processed, and dispositioned by automated services, which means a human being may never see the file. So what I've written in the book is you need to change culture, you need to change actual tooling, and you need to build those controls across the company's ecosystem. You know, it's a bit like, you know, when you, I've lived in India for 20 years, 18 years before I moved to the US, a lot of addresses in India don't actually have the street, you know, name, or they don't have the actual grid level details. So I think except for Chandigarh. So in the US, you just have my home number, my street name, and the name of the city and the zip code. That's all it takes to find my home. But in India, you have to basically say it's behind X school next to Y temple. It's a very nice, my wife is from the US. She often finds it very funny because it's very different. So fixing privacy issues is like finding an address in India. You have to look at multiple landmarks, multiple roads, multiple paths to actually understand where somebody actually lives. So ironically, I think I have to, when I build privacy controls and strategies, either for my, the company I work for or I recommend to somebody else, I think about what must it be like to look for an address in India. And essentially I let, I pretend the last 22 years haven't happened. And I basically wake up the they see inside me and that's the approach I, I use. Not because that's necessarily the best foolproof approach, but, but because the world I'm trying to address is a lot more scattered than it used to be. No, I think, sir, Nishant, you are very much right. It's all about people, process, and technology. We call it PPT. Very nice three words. We can put them anywhere, but very difficult when it comes to implement anything. So, for example, we always talk about external leakage of data, that uh, data will be leaked and uh, people, hackers can do it. But insider threats, what about leakage of information between different verticals of the company, of a company. For example, Uber is a, it's a very big company. Mm. Any country we go for, if it does not have Uber, we're like, okay, is this even a good city we are living in? It does not support Uber. What should we do? We go to Paris, we go to Amsterdam, we always, this is the default app. 
so this is also a standard for the cities but i have also been in amazon another big company mm -hmm. so what i have seen is data is there all the security measures are there there will be no external leak but the engineers have access to most of the things so big companies like uber amazon what they do is they make sure not even all the engineers have access to a particular data it's not like i can just go and uh, uh, pull up a history of uh, say any celebrity for example amitabh bachchan what has he bought on uh, amazon or where did he travel uh, from uber whether i am from amazon i was i'm in amazon or in uber so privacy has to be implemented at that level so that even the developers understand that okay making the data available throughout the organization does not mean that um, you have to do it and you have to share all the pii's but we'll discuss more about uh, as we move forward so uh, as for the disclaimer guys this presentation is for solely educational purpose here me or nishant we do not we gave up personal views on this we do not represent the companies mm -hmm. so please uh, and all the rights are being uh, reserved by saro and of course and you do not need to record this session as we say again and again because we'll again put it on youtube you will find it there and you can uh, browse through it again thank you i don't, i don't want to jump on one point you made rohit which is sort of the insider risk my approach from the very beginning has been that at the end of the day you have to desensitize the data you have to make sure that whether it's internal or external access is managed and collection is managed and destruction is managed based on the need of the data and the legitimate use case of the data so the, the reason this is important is because if you identify insider risk as a vector or at least as, as the initial point of your privacy or security program you are almost certain to get off to a bad start with the company i think people often underestimate the challenge of fundamentally changing the company's culture like remember for the last 10 years we have told engineers and not just told them we have tied their promotions their incentives their bonuses their stock grants to a few very very engagement driven metrics how many products did you ship how many users did did, did you onboard how many markets did you open so essentially the emphasis has been all the way through on growth growth and more growth and now suddenly we are telling engineers that you have to pay attention to the central privacy team as well so the whole point of having decentralized development was to cut back on the process cut back on the bureaucracy you know like people have often said a famous politician has said minimum government maximum governance that's essentially what we've told them for the last 10 years but what what now we're telling them is that you have to pay attention to the central team which will basically enforce principles that are very different from the very same principles that have made you successful 10 years ago and nobody likes change like we all pretend in the tech sector that we are big disruptors and we love disrupting other people's lives but when we get disrupted we complain like nobody else's business right so i think rather than thinking of is it as insider or external risk ask yourself what is the data that we have identify tag inventory data at the point of ingest define policies that map to specific risk levels that are represented by that tag and at that point anywhere anyhow in any place in any system when the data gets used in a way that deviates from the actual policy enforcement on the other side of the spectrum you have an alert that goes in which means you are now co increasing coverage you are improving access you are improving visibility and you are reducing lat latency in terms of response time so the goal is to catch these things at scale and every time you catch these things build ai models to essentially do it faster better at scale the next time so you are not just pro mis pro preventing a mistake happening in the here and the now but you are building a system that will prevent that mistake in other parts of the company as well so the only way to do this is to do it with automation manual scaling and intervention based on ai models and past behavior in effect the same things that cause privacy problems are the very same things that will help you detect and prevent and remedy those problems when they happen i'm so much connecting with you nishant because i have been a developer myself i know how what kpis were given to me and how my team used to scale and now how the world is changing i'll get back to that so first let's uh, let's also move forward to the presentation but i'll come back to that especially the culture one because uh, data analytics is one big topic one big elephant in the room that companies have been told to go data driven and now they are being told okay you cannot have access to all the data whether you are the data analytics team or you are the ml team so we'll come back to that so guys a short thing about uh, saro what we do is we help as i have already told you we do uh, 
we help the customers implement the security solutions, the privacy solutions. We also make certain solutions for them. We make privacy platforms. We help them in their compliance. We help them in the security, whether it's VAPT, whether it's ISO, whether it's uh, building something from them, building our um, simple tools. So this is what we do. We have been there, uh, I think, so throughout the globe. If you follow Saro, um, I myself take care of the European business and lead Saro there, based out of Netherlands. Now, coming back to our topic, the agenda for today, you guys know it's privacy engineering. We have talked a lot about it, but what will we be covering in this is the definition and what are the objectives of it and how do we put privacy engineering in practice? Because that is the main thing. We can talk about it, we can uh, say that it has to be done, This is these are the principles and these are the best practices. But when it comes to implementation, it gets all messed up. We'll be also talking about the best practices and the benefits of it. That we, have, we love that word, privacy by design, but how does it happen? So let's move forward. So quick question for you guys. Is privacy engineering helpful in implementation of privacy by design? People are going, yes. Is there a no? No no's. So everybody believes basically either uh, explicitly or implicitly that privacy engineering is helpful for uh, implementation of privacy by design. We all know privacy engineering is helpful for the implementation of privacy by design. Yes, it's correct. But let's hear from Nishan. Nishan, what do you think is privacy engineering? And so, uh, how does it make the impact? Yeah, so happy to answer that question. So privacy engineering is about making sure that privacy is built not just into the design, but in the actual engineering process end to end. The reason privacy by design is often a little hackneyed and old fashioned is because it implies that you have to build privacy into the design and then you are done. But I'm not, I've never actually been able to understand what privacy by design actually is supposed to mean. So the book that I wrote was initially titled Privacy by Design. And then we were running focus groups with the publisher and literally nobody understood or liked the topic. And these were people on the engineering side who would essentially have been the number one customers for the book. And they are buying the book in big numbers, but they did not like the title. So there is something fundamentally wrong in a sense where the most common phrase in privacy, the privacy by design, doesn't quite register in a way that people actually understand. Because I think it's extremely critical for a slogan to be understood by the people who we are aiming at with that slogan, right? That's point number one. So for me, privacy engineering means getting privacy concepts and controls, be it like deletion, Data, tagging data, identifying data, encrypting it, measuring egress of data, identifying re-identification risk, things like that. How do you build all of these systems, tools, and processes throughout the company's ecosystem? So end-to-end -end in the data lifecycle, storage at rest in multiple infrastructure locations. So whether you're talking about in-memory Redis or you're talking about unstructured data in Cassandra, MongoDB, or data warehouse, which is more additive than subtractive in nature, how do you build privacy controls and privacy checks and visibility across the system? And by very extension of that, I also mean build out these controls in the engineering community, in the machine learning marketing community, in the marketing and product teams. How do you build these controls in terms of the data infrastructure and the, at the team level? Which means the scaling of that technique will ensure that anytime there is something going wrong on the privacy side, your odds of catching it go up. The speed of fixing it you know, goes, uh, goes up as well. And your understanding of how to prevent that from happening again which is sort of like privacy by design goes up as well. So it is a lot more comprehensive. It's a lot more improvisational. It's a lot more contextual for that company in, in this case, right? So privacy engineering is this umbrella term, basically that covers a whole lot of interventions that are adaptive to the company's unique threat vector. You're right, I think, Sunishan. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a right way to say that uh, uh, privacy engineering is much, much, much more scalable because it is about how we can build it all throughout the organization, but not just the product or the application we are building. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great thing. Exactly. And also, the, you will not get this right the first time around. Like, and there will come a point where the more you fix on the privacy side, the more you find. You know, usually when you do something in life, you can see improvements, right? You 
you work out, you lose weight. You know, you clean your room, you can start seeing stuff more clearly and there's less dust in the air. The problem with privacy and security engine is, and I'm being very realistic for the audience here, since I know all of you care about this topic, is that privacy engineering starts not at zero, you start at minus five. Because what happens is a company has to build a level of tech, tech debt before they realize that privacy is a problem. A company has to build a certain amount of revenue and customer trust before they have the money to hire privacy engineers or train existing engineers into privacy. So one of the things you need to understand is it will take a while for you to show impact and show value and demonstrate that the risk is going down. And that's not because you are incompetent. It, it may be that you are making mistakes, but it is a nature of the reality of the world where you are being brought in after things have already gone wrong in many different ways. So your initial efforts will be spent towards preventing further damage. And it's hard to prove that you prevented damage. Like it's hard for me to prove that I didn't do something wrong, right? It's hard to prove a negative. So one thing people in this audience need to realize is that absence of evidence does not mean evidence of absence. Your effectiveness should not be judged in the first month or two alone. Sometimes you will find easy wins and I've been successful in that and lucky in that regard, but people should be realistic about how to set expectations vis-a-vis -vis privacy. So Nishant, I, I, I also have that experience. So if I go to my clients, most of them, they, they talk about compliance, they talk about uh, um, security when they are being breached and or they are going for a merger or acquisition or maybe for an IPO. That is where they come to compliance. Okay, there's some big word here, where's the elephant in the room? It's there, but they will not see it, whether it's budget constraint or it's a focus on uh, expansion, but they'll never see it. But once these things apply, you have to expand to, uh, you have to collaborate with big customers. You have to go, uh, go B2B. You have to go for an IPO. You have to go for a merger acquisition. Again, all compliance. Then they'll say, okay, what is the maturity of your privacy take? What is the maturity of your security controls? All of these things come up. But exactly. again, we'll move on to another question. Is privacy engineering correlated with management of personal information, guys? Very easy one. Till then, let me just... Yes, Nishan, we were talking about uh, compliance and uh, moving public or just selling off the company. What all we fantasy, guys? We build a company and we sell it, right? No, we don't. Osaro will build it. Yes, guys, previous engineering is always, it's um, it's correlated with management of personal information. Yes. Yeah. And I, and I love that you use a phrase like personal information because I've, you know, I'm not an attorney, but I've been told that things like sensitive data or personal data have specific meanings to it. But personal information seems like a safer term. And I think it's important to explore what that could mean contextually. So I, it could mean where I live. It could mean what I watch, what I eat, what I buy, because each of those things can map back to me. You can build online patterns. If you have a few data points about me in the digital world, you can identify me faster than even having my fingerprints. In some cases, a lot of studies have shown that. So that's important. And personal information could be a combination of information about me that lives in multiple systems. So you may not be able to identify me based on information that you have in AWS, for example. But if you combine your on-prem data, if you combine that to Cassandra, if you combine that to other cloud locations, you may be able to identify me. So this is something that a lot of engineers don't realize is that when they live in their silos, they feel that they have done the right thing by providing you encryption or obfuscation or access control. But if somebody manages to get access to that data and combines that to other data sets and builds out that profile over time, not only can you be identified, but you could be physically tracked and there could be all kinds of harm visited upon you. Not to mention, if you have a, an, a, an enterprise contract with somebody else, they will require that the data that belongs to their customers is kept secret and kept privacy safe. So if you don't have the right controls to manage and identify personal information that is privacy engineering, you might be in violation of your enterprise contract, which means it's one thing for you to fail at privacy in a tool that is largely available to the public for free, okay? I'm not saying you should be cavalier about privacy in that regard, but there is a greater degree of forgiveness because the tool is free, right? But if you have an enterprise business and if you have, are serving, let's say Boeing or Airbus or, or a government entity, making privacy mistakes there could be very expensive because you have just given your customer the ability to sue you if their customers sue them. So people need to be a lot more careful because we have not yet combined privacy to enterprise business so far in this conversation. So for people who think that privacy mistakes can be fixed without too much damage, you need to realize that the people holding you accountable are not just government officials or regulators, but they could be other businesses whose revenue depends upon you doing the right thing for privacy. 
yes guys so liability is also is always one thing in privacy that uh, where does it who is to blame and um, your businesses if they are getting impacted by you because of your previous practices essentially there is a fine but there is also a reputational loss so none of us wants to go that way and uh, when it comes to data yes you are right we can take just the example of uh, maybe uber trips like for example uh, we can give it to the engineers for data analytics and uh, say okay what can you find uh, from this but what data can we say it's pia or not just the trips map is it pia maybe not but if you uh, if you assign it with the uh, person's identity they are maybe you will be able to find some outliers but generally if you just have your trips they are just what to say they are non pia so but uh, it's up to us to decide what kind of data can we uh, let engineers see and uh, develop upon so nishan you you are you are leading the, what to say the data analytics uh, division so you must have felt that right that okay i want to give uh, some data for analytics but i al- always have to make sure that okay they do not have what to say uh, more than enough information with them they should have just the information they are able to uh, to make uh, in- get insights from yeah so just to kind of respond to that i want to speak more generally because i'm like i said i'm representing yeah. myself here not anybody yeah, yeah 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 i think so we can uh, move that yeah but i can speak more in the abstract that's totally fine yeah. so i'm going to try and combine your question with a couple of other questions that are in the chat um the reason access control is hard is because people don't always know what they need and we are accustomed to thinking that our use case is privacy safe so we want access to everything so what the analytics team routinely does that whatever company i i work in their job is to identify these patterns who is accessing what what is the correlation between team a that is responsible for 10% of the company's revenue but they have 25% of the company's data those kinds of disconnects those kind of kinds of patterns anti patterns false positives false negatives building up that use case over time is what the analytics team does and that tells us which team needs more training which team needs a faster deployment of those controls which team has the risk of essentially doing something that is irreversibly wrong it enables us to not just build the right team but enable, enables us to identify to the leadership of that team that they need to do things differently vis-a-vis data which could include to your point access control usage of tools privacy security reviews audits things like that now think about it this way from a security perspective we, it has become very common these days for executives to get trained with phishing and malware attacks right so they get sent an email and we check at the back end are they clicking the email are they able to detect it in time the goal is to catch people in a moment when they are busy when they are likely to be uh, swamped and where they are most distracted and therefore they'll click on the link so those kinds of trainings are important for security but they give you some kind of shock value and that lets you know exactly how to train people right the problem with privacy is is very different the security risk i just mentioned the malware phishing the script injection that happens when specific people click on a link in an email and those can be very targeted like it could be people that are not very tech savvy it could be people for whom english is not the first language or it could be very senior executives but when it comes to privacy mistakes or mishandling of personal data it can happen with any employee it can happen to a junior employee that just graduated last week so the risk vectors are more complex in nature but the people who can cause the risk and actually cause damage could be spread across the company you cannot just get through it by targeting four or five executives on a given sunday so i feel like that is something fundamentally that needs to be understood and that is why the analytics team is very important because just as the malware phishing campaigns catch you in a targeted moment of uncertainty the data analyst can identify patterns over a period of time are we seeing more risks coming from a specific region of the world are we seeing specific kinds of apis abuse our data you need to identify patterns and you need need to make sure that those fixes apply in tooling across the company then become part of the training then become part of the alerting so you need to cast a much wider net for privacy because the risks are not as neatly defined as they are for example for platform security application security or cloud security in the security domain the risks are, are contained largely because there is a specific domain that maps to specific risks that is not the case with privacy at all so i can understand that because uh, for previous uh, what to say um, previous engineering there is yet to we have to uh, we are waiting for a standard to come there is no particular standard but i think so uh it will be here yeah and i feel like the i'm glad you mentioned the standard uh, rohit because 
there are too many people in the US, I'm sure in India, in, in the EU as well, that genuinely believe that privacy regulation will save them. Now, to them, I say this. Uh, most people in the US don't file taxes by hand. They use software like TurboTax, h and Block, and a lot of those software tools are terrible. The UI is really bad. It is not easy to understand why they are recommending certain things that they are. The only certainty you have is that those tools have privacy, not privacy, but tax regulation coded at the back end, which means the deduction you can take, the exemptions you can claim, the rebates you get are all baked in the back end. So you have that level of security and certainty. So I, I kind of feel like uh, that is why privacy regulation is hard to scale because it is very hard to build a tool based on regulations that are not very prescriptive, not very detailed. Sometimes those regulations are contradictory in nature. So my advice to people would be use a combination of internal tooling, as I've mentioned, analytics, as I've mentioned, and some combination of audits to identify these patterns, anti-patterns, and then build an internal abstraction of GDPR, CCP, et cetera. So identify the laws that are known worldwide. And then from those laws, you need to identify things that you can easily action inside your company from a tooling perspective and start building those controls and the regulations in partnership with the legal team. The benefit of doing that would be that your legal teams and your engineering teams will learn how to work with each other. That is not something that is very easy. Like you need to build those partnerships before something bad happens. Like you fix your roof before the rainy, rainy season comes, right? So the goal to build privacy regulation within the company is before an external regulation suddenly forces you to change things. And GDPR was such a huge tax for companies, right? So my advice would be don't wait for Brussels or DC or New Delhi or some other capital to pass a law. Do the right thing internally first because then you will be able to do it a lot more economically and more importantly, your risk reduction techniques for privacy will benefit the business overall. So you want to make sure that you don't wait for privacy to become the forcing function. Use other forcing functions like, like economies of scale, storage costs, machine learning query optimization. Use those forcing functions to achieve privacy goals and wait for the right moment for privacy to be the only forcing function. Otherwise, going to engineers, going to the board of directors again and again for privacy will produce diminishing returns over time. I think so. You are right and uh, right on the mark, I would say. Even if we go for with the objectives of privacy engineering, I think so they will fall and they will tell people that, okay, this is the aim, that the preparedness is the aim of privacy engineering. So even if you are doing it without a standard and you know, but because in, in our, uh, what to say, in our guts, we know that, okay, this is what, when we are doing it, it's wrong. We're not allowed to access uh, anybody's PII. So if you're building practices, if you're building processes around that, that would help a lot. And believe me, guys, big tech companies in India or big banks in India, they're not exactly doing it. They're not, they're literally waiting for the law to come. Once the India, uh, Indian law passes, there will be a mayhem. They'll have to go through a tech transformation just to enable privacy because they do not have any infrastructure in place. They'll have to build it. So Nishant, what are your uh, uh, views on the objectives of uh, previous engineering? There are three main views for when it comes to objectives. And I, I love the fact that you put predictability, manageability, and disassociability is all at the same time, because what you're trying to do is avoid surprises. I mean, Facebook uh, has some of the smartest engineers. A lot of my friends work there, and yet they were caught by surprise by Cambridge, right? Because the data size is just too vast. The same thing for manageability. How do you not just get it right, but get it right at scale, get it right in a way that is not unnecessarily slowing the business down because the worst thing you can do for privacy is create what I call privacy theater, the illusion of privacy by coming up with complex processes and checkbox and forms and meetings, which will be very, very hard to manage. So you want predictability and manageability, but you also want to make sure that you have actual goals. So how do you disassociate somebody's personal data from their activity? How do you disassociate their data from the rest of the cohort if that particular individual needs some level of privacy protection? So these three are extremely critical uh, as well. Uh, I also want to make sure before we move far too fast, Rohit, then before we lose time, Akarsh has a question about, can we get the details of the discussion through your book? So I want to, is it, is it okay, Rohit, if I just address that yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So Akarsh, I have split the book and the certification course in two, three different parts. The first is how do you build the governance, which is how do you build controls around recognizing the data? How do you me measure privacy risk? How do you make sure that everybody understands what the risk is across the board in the company? So the first one third of the book helps you understand privacy in the concept of the organization. And by the way, to understand that portion, you don't have to be an expert in very complex privacy techniques. You 
you probably won't get an award in like the next privacy engineering Olympiad. I don't think, know if such a thing exists by reading the first one third of the book. The goal of that first one third is to make sure that people actually understand the level of risk they're sitting on. How do they come up with a central governing methodology for privacy while also allowing engineers to remain decentralized to actually build the tools that make the company money. So achieving the business goal of engagement and profit alongside the privacy goal of protection is what the first one third is about. The second one third is about actually building tooling where I've given you very, very technical deep dives on protecting the users by way of deletion, data export by way of DSAR, building consents, all the things Apple cares about. How do you build privacy tooling in a way that is internal to the company or by procuring a third party solution in a way that directly addresses the concerns of regulators, be they somebody like Apple or somebody like the FTC. That's the second part of the book. The third part of the book is scaling the actual program, gathering the right metrics, using security tools for privacy, building you know, metrics for the board of directors. So the book talks about how do you get started? How do you go deep and how do you get broad? The book is essentially in three parts. The certification course I've talked about essentially gives you the much more detailed hand, hands-on skills because I'm actually on video teaching you how to make those techniques happen. There is an actual coding console. So what I'm trying to do is in the absence of a law, in the absence of a global standard, how do you train your existing workforce for privacy? Not by making privacy and security seem like this esoteric, you know, foreign concept that is only for a select few, but how do you make it more accessible to people who make a million decisions every single day? That is the engineers, the attorneys, the product managers, the data analysts, things like that. So Nishant, you, you also mentioned uh, something about uh, building privacy tools. So do you think that building platforms should also be one of the objectives of privacy engineering or can it be left out to the biggies of the world like OneTrust, Big ID, or should it be embedded into the principles within the company that if infrastructure is missing, they can always outsource it. We can always build new, but if they can, they should, they should try to build it even the tech part, uh, uh, this is beyond process. So should it be one of the objectives there to well, build infrastructure, be, previous infrastructure? Totally, totally. It should be one of the objectives simply because the longer you wait, the harder it gets. Because as you move, I, I have this diagram of a funnel in my book going from left to right. The narrow end of the funnel is the left-hand side. The broad end is the right-hand side. The left represents the edge API layer, the inflection point where the data first enters the company. The closer you can get to that point in terms of building out your governance, A, the cheaper it will be because the data size is small. B, the more significant the risk reduction will be because you're catching the data before somebody can use it. And C, the better it will be for engineers and product managers downstream because now they know that the data they want to use is as free from privacy risk as possible because you have applied those controls early on. So the reason behind starting it early is not because I'm a major privacy advocate, I am but it's right for the business. It's better for the business. It's better for the customer. It's better for your in-house engineers. It's better for everyone because no engineer that I know of, no smart engineer at least, will want to use the data and have that sword hanging over their head that something could be going wrong. How would you feel if you have collected the data over six, seven, eight months, built the tool for six, seven, eight months, spent all this time writing good code, uh, good documentation, you have it ready, API is open, the contract is ready to go, and then you find out something can't ship. There is there are very, very few things in life that are worse than missing out on shipping something on time just because the privacy risk that you should have foreseen was not acted upon. So building it early is absolutely critical. Okay, I can totally get you, uh, Nishant. I can totally get you because IT projects, they run for years and we cannot get, get them wrong. Exactly. And also, like you don't get credit for shipping something halfway through. Like You pretty much have to ship something for it to make revenue, right? And also... Doing it early means that you can now track the data across your system. You don't always know how your business is using data. And I think that's the biggest limitation. And that hurts you not just from a privacy security perspective. It also hurts you in terms of understanding the quality of your data. How reliable is the insight that you're deriving from the data, right? So doing it early is very, very important for the business because I feel like a lot of companies are scared of getting the answers from privacy simply because, you know, it's like addiction. We are all addicted to data, you know? I have talked to a friend of mine who was once an alcoholic and he told me that the very reason he was struggling to give up alcohol was because he knew there would be a moment where he was not drinking anymore, but he, he still has to look in, at himself in the mirror and get a sense of what he looks like after looking at six months of alcohol consumption, what it does to your body, what it does to your face. And that moment is very scary because you have not fixed the addiction yet, nor can you actually drink more because that's what caused the problem to begin with. And that moment of fear, that moment between recognizing a problem and fixing it is a very vulnerable one. 
and a lot of companies are afraid of that moment because then they won't know what to do and then they're afraid of having to disclose that information so the earlier you fix the problem the more you can not just delay but actually prevent that moment of uncertainty from hitting you in the face so there is a, there's always a backlog in the companies and especially related to compliance and security standards and uh, people are literally afraid to check and go there and check the weight of that bag that backlog sorry <laughs> exactly but um, coming back to our topic previous engineering and people are very enthusiastic to see how exactly can we put it to practice because we say that okay we can do it to uh, predict and manage privacy within the company but how do we put it in practice nishant yeah you put it in practice by showing people how their jobs have gotten better so there are several anecdotes that i can use so i've worked for companies where the number of instances we went through every single day where we found new data that was outside of our scope went down which means at some point we had fixed enough problems and more importantly we had changed the company's culture in a way that people were not doing that stuff to begin with so the number of surprises went down which means we could sign enterprise contracts with a lot more confidence we were able to speak to regulators with a lot more confidence so when you start seeing that that's one way to sort of make the case for it the second thing you will see is the quality of the data improves which means also what was happening in some of these companies was we had so much data at the back end that machine learners and data scientists could not get responses on time which meant that when it comes to driving insights from data every second matters if i'm running ads based on your physical location or based on your your retail history i have to catch you in the moment and then give you the ad that is the most germane to you right now correct from a business perspective if i can't get those insights in time my ability to monetize the data is significantly compromised so what would happen is a lot of machine learning experts would keep pounding the same warehouse data for more and more queries so now your own queries from this moment are competing for compute power with your own other queries from 10 seconds ago and it's like a, the ultimate traffic jam it's like downtown mumbai or downtown la everybody's honking everybody's burning fuel but nobody's moving so when you stop when you see that easing up a little bit because the data is smaller in size better quality some queries can be answered with fewer runs so when you start seeing that that's how you make the case so you will basically be able to see those metrics which is why i said initially in this call that it takes time to build that information simply because you will have to go through some of the pain to identify the depth of the problem you will then have to go through some pain to sample exactly what your low hanging fruit is and then be able to reduce the data size and then the people who've gotten accustomed to things not working well will come and tell you oh you know this privacy change you made is actually improving my life right so when you start seeing the reduction in the risk when you start seeing the more increased productivity of your customers that's when you will be able to make the case much more effectively but you have to promise that you will do these things because just saying that you're doing it for gdpr or ccpa will not win you any friends because we have been saying this for the last 4 or 5 years and frankly the engineers the board of directors everybody is tired of hearing these phrases so now you have to shift a little bit and make the argument based on engineering productivity data quality and cost uh, reduction i can understand nishant but um, we would also like to know that how does privacy by design play its role in this privacy by design plays its role in in all of this simply because as you can say in the in, in the very diagram right now as you can see privacy by design basically is at the far left which means it includes everything like translating legal requirements embedding tools so privacy by design basically in this context as ambiguous a phrase as it may be it means in this context that you are embedding privacy across the company's ecosystem you are making sure that the attorneys on the privacy legal side understand how engineering actually works you are motivating the engineers to understand how what they are doing either hurts the company's legal position or improves it so privacy by design basically means that everybody plays a part in reducing the privacy risk and helping the customer so privacy by design basically means that it's everybody's job it's not just the job of the privacy team that's why it's so effective for me because everybody in the company who plays a part in product or infrastructure or the data design now is a partner for you in implementing privacy by design so in the earlier slide guys when you are talking about building infrastructure for privacy so all of it comes under privacy by design so when we are gathering the requirements when we are talking to the customers we have to make sure that even the design of the product that we are building is compliant and for that we also have to realize what kind of a infrastructure do we have in the company
are we missing anything do we need to uh, maybe buy some external tool we have to license some external tool or do we have something uh, within the company if we have a framework for uh, dsar are we getting attached to it or maybe there's a tool like one trust are we getting attached to it is the database registered is it is the data lineage working there so these are all things that helps in privacy engineering because now the organization know what's happening and all this power as nishan said it's a shift lift momentum all this power is being given to the developers and the product managers that when you are building it do it correct so that it fits the larger picture so we'll move on and there's another question is data flow modeling a part of privacy engineering very important very important believe me is yeah. data flow modeling a part of privacy engineering what is a data flow basically it's a diagram which tells you how the data flows within an application an ecosystem and within a company it can go up to any detail so how does it help does it even relate to privacy engineering if you know what data is flowing where would it help you get comply when you have to start a dpia or any assessment you need to know how data is flowing through the applications you cannot and shall not go into an ecosystem where you do not have that because you'll talk to people you'll talk uh, to different stakeholders but they might miss information because they are humans but once you have a diagram which is on paper it can be reviewed by multiple guys people so it's a very important thing yeah and also feel like if you build privacy engineering correctly if you have the tagging done early on if you build data lineage you can do data flow modeling a lot more accurately and you can yeah. foresee a lot of things that will go wrong because at some point people are going to do things based on what somebody else is doing right like at some point the originality of human behavior is, is exhausted so what that means is if you have been able to identify data movements if you can then identify data changes if you can then track the flow of data across your system uh, data flow modeling basically is pretty much that which is using the past as a prologue and not predicting necessarily but modeling the possibility of future behavior so that means you can predict what somebody will buy in a month from now just as you can predict the mistake an engineer is going to make because privacy is about privacy by design data flow modeling is about using broad trends to identify individual atomic risks now uh, mentioned that yes data flow modeling is a part of privacy engineering but there are a lot more so nishan what are your uh, how do you see uh, the core areas of privacy engineering do we, do we think we should add something or uh, do you think that how does it help to foster privacy engineering is it all of them have to build have to be built or um, how does it what is the most important one i think all of them at the same time would help and that doesn't mean everything has to be built soup to nuts at the same time what i'm advocating for is that try and build each of these based on your business use cases see what makes the most sense for companies that are heavily focused on a very linear waterfall flow the pia might be sufficient for companies that collect a ton of data in high volumes from different customers different apis that egress data you need data flow modeling possibly you also need requirements engineering you might need processes to make sure that you are in line with compliance regimes like iso like iso fedra etc if you work in defense of the government so i would use these as a starting point and then deciding which of these are most applicable for your business at this point in time so the guys these these are what to say the core pillar these are the core infrastructure over your which can be provided to a team to the engineering team over which they can build upon so if you do not have your requirements engineering if they do not know they do not have enough trainings what is the exact data that they should their uh, ear should be itchy about then they will not do it so this is the core infrastructure over which the privacy engineering practice can be built upon So exactly. moving forward exactly. we have the previous engineering framework so we all know how the cycle works like from the requirements to the production but how does it fit into the privacy uh, landscape nishant 
So are you talking specifically about the entire diagram or are we talking about a specific modality here? I would say let's talk about the entire diagram as this flow because it's a pipeline. Yeah. Right. I think so, privacy will flow across the board. So I would say if you're going to go with privacy by design, uh, it will flow right across the board. The key part is going to be how do you make sure the left, the left line coming down from the left to right is pretty clear to me. Where it gets complicated is once you design something, how do you integrate that with the existing ecosystem practices, the tech stack? Remember, it was not built for central privacy control management, right? How do you integrate that control across the board? How do you make sure people understand how it, where, how it works, where it lives? And how do you make people respond to the new knowledge you have, have about privacy? I think the co concept development, requirements engineering, system architecture, system design, all of those are pretty intuitive at this point because those are controlled by the central team. But when you go to system integration, test and evaluation, and then operation maintenance and remediation, that is where you need to make sure that the business as a whole participates. So that's the challenge. But I think it's a collective approach. It's sequential. It's incremental. So yeah, broadly agree with you. It's a sequential approach when we're building a product. But um, especially in terms of managing this, uh, it becomes a headache, right? Because at some point of time, the product grows and we add new fields to it. And we, it, they might be PII, they might not be PII, but we have to be always ready. The infrastructure is there, but people are not vigilant. So what are your views on that, Nishant? So do, does it, can we take care of it by just trainings or should we have some tools there? Or both. how do I we do it? Training, I would say training and tools both. I would say you start with training. Based on the training, you can, when you get feedback on the training, you build the tools or you could have the tools working in the background anyways, but you have training making the tools better and tools making the training better. So you need a bit of both, but I would say just training or just tools may not be as effective, but having them both work in tandem and inform each other would be the way to go. Yeah. So guys, there are tools which have been developed for the pipelines, uh, which go and check your code for PII data. They will check for multiple patterns. If you have used something like, uh, if you've added something like name, or maybe uh, bank ID, they would catch it. Email ID, they would just say, okay, boss, your developer has uh, added this field here. Can you review it? So they will give you a privacy overview of your code. So it's a, it's a very good thing that before going into production, the managers, the product managers can know, okay, this is the requirement we sent. And for this, this new field was required, but this was not reported to us. We do not know. We did not run it through the compliance team. Maybe we need a PIA there. These tools helps a lot. Exactly. And they help a lot because otherwise you are interrupting engineers. You're slowing them down and you're yep. creating more and more surprises. And at some point, people will either give up or your company will slow down. Either extreme is not helpful. Because once the things reach in, reaches in production, then it becomes very difficult to solve. And if it's in production, it's in breach of the compliance laws. So it's a, it's a very simple equation. You have to stop it before it reaches production. Otherwise, it's always a mitigation that you are doing, a correction you are doing. But here, if you stop it before production, it's all good. Exactly. And also, you want to make sure that you take away the surprise element, right? You want to make sure that you show the board of directors that your tools are actually working. Because what you don't want it to become is something where you build a lot of tooling, a lot of uh, process, but it never gets adopted. So we'll move on to another question, Nishant. Are there any standards available to integrate privacy into software development lifecycle? Guys, I have already given you the answer for this. There are certain guidelines present. If you check the Norwegian Data Authority website, but do we have a standard as of yet for software development lifecycle? It's a quite a tie. It's a quite a tie. Six four is not dominating each other. It's a quite a tie, guys. The answer is unfortunately no. We do not have a standard as of yet. We have certain guidelines which can be followed that have been given by the uh, Norwegian uh, Data Authority and uh, Data Protection Authority, but uh, essentially there's no particular standard that you can okay. follow. It's a gap, it's a void in the privacy industry. 
we know how policies work we know how the processes work but we do not know what to do with our software development life cycle we talk about data uh, privacy by design but there is no standard challenges associated with privacy implementation in an organization the best we want to talk about always the challenges and how it's difficult is what uh, we as compliance guys like to talk about nishant what are the challenges that you think uh, organization yeah, i'm just jumping here the challenges range from adoption to building the tool correctly to making it scale to making sure that you make the case that this tool is actually improving things because remember when you preemptively fix privacy correctly you are preventing a negative like you are preventing something bad from happening right so it's like you don't get credit for a job well done if that job well done means preventing some future hypothetical threat so the biggest challenge that you uh, will face is not necessarily any one of these but all of these collectively the lack of standards means it's hard to prioritize the data usability aspect means people don't always understand how changes to the data for privacy could actually help the data uh, the system design complications how do you make sure that the system the ecosystem the tech stack absorbs privacy tooling that takes time because there is opportunity cost and you can be very honest about that and then identifying the data which is kind of the beginning of the process i think all four are, are challenges but individually they are easy to deal with not easier but sorry not easy but easier but collectively they compete for time and for attention and for context with the rest of the company so is there anything from your book that can help us uh, understand the challenges uh, nishant i mean i wrote the book primarily for an audience like this one which is comprehensive which is diverse so some people on this call will be more at the governance system architecture level so they'll appreciate the first one third others will actually build point solutions they'll appreciate the second part and then there'll be the more senior leaders who need to make it scale need to think about the board of directors need to think about how do you position this as a competitive brand so uh, i think the book will speak to all all three use cases so I, that's why i wrote the book i wrote the book for people who are today in the situation i was in 10 years ago but in my case my biggest difficulty was not having easy references but there was no gdpr there was no ccpa high profile risks were not as visible right so i i was able to make my mistakes in a much more innocuous environment where the pressure on me was a lot lower the pressure on today's engineers today's customers today's companies is much higher so that's why i wrote the book to make sure that people have the knowledge have the context before something major goes wrong i think so you are right and especially when it comes to gdpr when it comes to the tech companies of europe and usa it's a, it's a, it's one more thing one more component that should be added here is it a move that is budget and the culture yeah and i think if you get all these three things right these yeah. four things right progressively the budget will largely take care of itself and i talk about this in the book how you can use security tools for privacy how you can have the platform data warehousing teams make the case for reducing data sizes so you can get a lot of your ideas implemented without spending privacy budget or without using even privacy as a name because you will have other teams within the business making the case to do the exact same thing now i don't care if some other team gets the credit for it as long as my job is made easier which is to reduce privacy risk nishant i think so your book then hits the nail right on its head because if you talk about reducing budget it's a thing it's a very difficult thing how to reduce the it budget and especially with a new project going in if you say that we can reuse security tools and we can optimize data in the data warehouse it's a win it's always exactly. a win exactly and the less data you have in the warehouse especially if it's data you don't need my question is why are you spending all this money to encrypt data and protect it when you don't have when you don't need the data to begin with why are you paying cloud providers a ton of money to store data that is doing no providing no useful benefit to your business why are you holding on to that data that could then be egressed by a third party api that is unscrupulous and then you get all the blame so it's one thing if you can derive value from the data and then you can think about how do you position that from a privacy perspective but it's something totally different when in an age of economic uncertainty you are wasting time wasting resources wasting storage space on data that is doing nothing to benefit your business and to add to that it is hurting your trust relationship with the customer so guys just to tell you data warehouses are expensive and if somebody tells you they can uh, make them compliant and reduce cost they are gods they are heroes we'll move on to the next slide that is about the best practices implemented in organization 
So for most of them, we hear that it has to be done through third party tools like OneTrust, Big ID. These help a lot. But um, what do you think, Nishant? What can be the other best practices, or uh, how can the organization grow with privacy? Um, it can. I would basically say these are all connected. I think trust is for me ref that refers to all the tools. Privacy policy basically means all the individual controls I talked about. Cookie notice is one example of which. And privacy impact assessment will be uh, something that the legal team will, will use as a checking mechanism, right? So I think of these not as separate things necessarily. They're atomic, but they're all very connected. These are like different islands. And privacy from a trust perspective, from an impact perspective, uh, is something that connects. It's like the bridge between these islands. So I would think of these not as, an, as individual tools or processes, but as a collective unit that protects the company and protects the customers at the same time. So these are categorized as privacy tools, but really you should be doing these anyways. It just so happens that privacy is the official forcing function for all of these. So I would use the culture, I would use the word culture here, that best practices give rise to a culture. And once you have the culture in place, it seems like, okay, this has to be done. This is by default. So this gives way to privacy by default, guys. Once you have the culture, it's always easy. But till then, you, you call it best practices, you call it policies, but this is how they are implemented. Maybe exactly. through trainings exactly. and making people aware through newsletters, through internal marketing, but eventually we'll have to build a culture. Perfect. And I think the culture is actually the main aspect here because without the culture change, you won't have any real progress. So we have another question, very simple one. Is privacy engineering synonymous to proactive protection? Very easy. This is all we want, that everything should go proactive. It should not be a reactive system that something happened and then we are reacting to it. We should be proactive. We should know what is happening and we should be able to mitigate it before it happens. Yes, guys, privacy engineering is synonymous to proactive protection yes so this is one of the benefits i would say so benefits of privacy engineering this is for the uh what to say when we go for a c-suit meeting when you go to the senior managing telling them okay we want to have these policies uh, enabled or we want to we'll have to have a data privacy team which can help not just the compliance but a shift left culture where engineers are more responsible. So this is the benefits. Nishan, what are your views on these? I mean, I think this is pretty much covered. I've talked about this a couple of times already, which is to make sure that it protects your company, it protects your customers, and it makes sure that your systems become a lot more efficient. So I kind of feel like this just kind of restates that a little more formally. But yeah, broadly agree with the message on here. I think so, guys, we have already discussed this thing and it's a very default thing when you're building something and where you're building something which can help you predict and manage things. There are benefits associated with it. And by this, we come to the end of the presentation. Nishan, you have written this book, this wonderful book. Guys, if you go to Amazon, there are literally very good views for this, very good reviews for this book. If you just click on the links, if you go to Amazon, check this book out. It's a wonderful book. Ishan, do you want to say something about it once? Yeah, more? no, thank you. And I, I usually don't stay up this late, but I, I knew this was going to be a very fun crowd. I love the questions. I love the discussion. And I would love to do this again at some point. Uh, uh, I genuinely enjoyed the conversation. I think uh, the book will benefit a lot of people that are entering this domain pretty brand new. And it will help them ask the right questions, go to the right people and provide the right solutions. Because I have explained in the book how this tooling actually works, how you run a program. But more importantly, I've referred to my own successes and my own failures so you can learn from actual real-world examples because I feel like without examples, it's hard to learn new things. So the book not just explains and teaches, but gives you examples as well. So I'm really hoping it benefits you and makes your companies and your customers more successful. Thank you, Nishan. Nishan, thank you for not only coming to this session, but for writing this book. It's a, it's a very important topic that people need to know and people need to learn from your experiences because we are young generation. We know that, okay, this law is here, but what are 
how do we implement it because this thing has not reached the engineers as of yet this is still a new topic this is growing we know about policies we know about compliance we know about fines but how to mitigate them this is still there so exactly. nishan thank yes nishan you want to add something i was agreeing with you yeah so thank you for the uh, coming on the session nishan thank you guys for joining in and see you next time definitely thank you all so much have a good night and stay safe have a good weekend have a good day guys